So uh, thank you, Guy. Um, this is the Esper Deltas uh, project. It's one of the three consortium funded ecosystem services for poverty alleviation. And that delta is the uh, Ganges Brahmaputra, uh, Ganges Brahmaputra Megnan Delta, which essentially makes up most of Bangladesh and part of India. And that's where we have focused our efforts. So here's Bangladesh. I mean, you can argue that a great deal of this is delta, in fact. But what we're studying is this coastal zone here. This is the, the famous Sundarban, the tigers. We met a few paw prints, a bit scary. Um, and, we occasion and we're going to be doing some sort of comparative with the Indian West Bengal side as well. So this is our, our uh, study site. It's quite a large consortia, as most of these are. Um, we have a number of UK, uh, we have 10 Bangladeshi partners, and the lead is um, the University of uh, engineering and technology and two Indian partners um, including one of the IITs which are the uh, good ones in JU and uh, Chinese partners so it's quite a substantial partner why are we studying uh, deltas well we always vie with uh, assets over how many people live in our various areas but it's about half a billion and it's growing population um, and of course hugely asset-rich environments. So that's what we're mainly studying, is these places are, have substantial ecosystem services and substantial support to uh, the population, but it's also a highly vulnerable environment. It's open to changes in um, environmental stresses. It's open to shocks. And because of the locations of some of these around the world, it also has a, a substantial population that are vulnerable and poor. And that's part of what we're aiming at. That's actually the Nile. Um, threatened deltas, looking at the number of expected people to be displaced um, by 2050. These figures are now beginning to change and become higher. But the, of the three major deltas, the Nile, the Ganges Brahmaputra, and the Mekong are identified. And this is some work by uh, groups involved in the project, uh, now involved in the project, uh, are identified as having issues to do with sea level rise and uh, <coughs> uh, large populations. The other thing is that deltas generally sink. We've got huge amounts of sediment coming onto a soft prism, and they tend to sink. Uh, so not only have you got sea level rise, but you've got a, a, a subsidence going on within the delta. And these, just very quickly, if you look at these pink areas, they actually sit below sea level. Interestingly, ours, is the sediment supply is so strong that um, they still manage to maintain uh, their, their presence above sea level, but perhaps by one or two metres. So you can see why they're particularly uh, vulnerable to sea level rise and changes in sedimentary input. And that's expanded a little bit here. Here's our study area. So we are less than a metre in just all of our areas. So you can imagine that that means small sea level rises, huge potential impacts. Um, basic facts. Uh, the key cities where we might be interested in, Kolkata, um, Dakar. We also have um, other cities in here, Barasal. Uh, and also water from the Himalayas is coming down to two systems, through the Brahmaputra coming down this way and through the Ganges into here. So we have substantial issues with flood uh, associated with these river systems, but also they bring in the much needed sediment and the much needed water supplies. And they are the source of tremendous political friction in the region. Well, everyone knows that sea level is, is rising, how much it's going to rise and where is, is open to conjecture. But if we were to put it within this sort of envelope, we do see that by 2050, 2060, we're seeing there's tr lots of literature showing the deltas being uh, substantially flooded. Um, OK, so our particular study area is within this region here, where we know we've got a, a mixture of ecosystem services and a, a strong presence of the uh, representation of the poor. Um, we're breaking that area down into census units that are called unions, and they represent perhaps five or six villages. So we want to do this at really quite high resolution. And uh, we're missing the data for this. We're working on that now. But you can see we're already we're starting to get poverty maps that we can utilize in this area. And this will be the unit of attribution. This will be the unit we study and project into the future. Um, in terms of water and why, what are the major issues that are going on? Well, we've got wetlands and floodplains, and here are some of the major ecosystem services. Obviously, forestries, looking at livelihoods and soils associated with the hydrological cycle. 
uh, agriculture and aquaculture, huge impact here is the freshwater aquaculture, as well as the shrimp and mango over the front, obviously not fresh water. Um, but we have this interface between the two, Kulna's the major local city, uh, uh, I was remembering. So hugely significant water-mediated ecosystem services in the region of study. That's why we felt it was uh, an important uh, region to study. Okay, what are the social economic trends that we're seeing? Growing populations, inequity, livelihoods. This is the security of the rural poor. And massive migrations to cities. Interestingly though, Kulna is getting smaller and people are migrating to Dakar. Um, and one of the things we're very interested in, what are the push-pulls? Do you go to the city simply because you're wealthier? But there's also the push that the ecosystem services are beginning to decline and collapse in your local region, so you begin to send people to the city. There are push-pulls, and that's one of the most interesting studies that we're going to be uh, hopefully getting out of that. Okay, research questions, relationships between ecosystem services and human well-being, we want to quantify. Lots of studies, very few actually try to quantify what are the relationships between poverty and the services that people can get. Provisioning service, food service, water cleaning service, ac mostly access to food, but transport as well. So what is it that people access? And if you lost them, how can we account for that? When, when we're thinking about decision makers. We need to start putting numbers and figures on what is actually lost if we lose these things. Lots and lots and lots of models at lots and lots of different scales. And the, the, the problem with this, and I won't go too much into this, is, and there's a social economic, is that if you want to understand what we're going to try to do is produce a sim city. You know, if you've seen the video game, we want to produce a simulation of the Delta Front so that we can perturb it and see what some of the outcomes are into the future. And to do that, we need to create a kind of virtual delta. And to do that, we need an awful lot of models. And that's, the, that's why it was described as an ambitious project. Um, we're, we're doing that at, at various scales. Now, in order to, uh, to do that, and in order to integrate that into one system, you have to have an immensely large brain. And we've got somebody called Attila Laser. It's a fantastic name, and he's a very clever chap. And he's spending his time trying to work with all the models at all the scales to produce something in a systems dynamics uh, approach. And that really is boxes and they're called stocks and flows. And I won't go too much into it, but within each of these runs a model or a relationship. And you build it up over time and you run this model. And uh, eventually you simplify the model, but we're trying to develop a system. And Stellar is a typical, here's a typical example of actually running it within a Stellar system. My interest is how we build it in a conceptual way. So how do we build these relationships? And this we're building with our own people, but mostly we're building with the Bangladeshis, the people in the, either at the field level or at the expert level, and we're trying to build up the relationships. I won't go too much into these. The squares are where we're seeing water. Particularly water is involved in these whole processes. And again, uh, sorry, I should say that one was for the Sundarban, and it's just the beginnings. We've got lots more to do, but there's a Sundarban model. Here's uh, a starting point for crop production. This is getting much larger now, but you can already see precipitation, salinity, high-intensity storms, river flooding. Obviously, there's a major relationship to water and mediation, uh, even the nature of settlements, fisheries, agriculture. A, all of this is going on at the top, but it's driven by these livelihoods underneath. Uh, fisheries, arsenic input, uh, again water, nutrients, nutrients supplied by river systems, etc. So whilst I can't go into the great details of this, water is such a fundamental part of any ecosystem service context that you're almost, they're almost synonymous at times. So as World Water Week, uh, we sort of wanted to, to emphasise that, and that's simply shrimp farming. Am I probably on time? Okay, so as I said, that's a a real five-minute Hamlet version of what we're doing, but um, what we wanted to mention was that this is a, a substantial process of quantification. We have to produce models. We have to produce models that we can integrate with each other so that our decision makers, our policy makers, in our case the Ministry of Planning in Bangladesh, are able to say to us, right, tell me what would happen if, let's say, uh, India extracts more water at the border, or what would happen if they give us more water and we try to plan it. What would happen if a dam was built right up in the high Himalaya? What would happen if we went for changed rice and went for this? We want to give policymakers space to 
pull more levers than they normally do. They normally have one or two responses. And we want to literally provide a piece of software that allows them to explore different and even mixed options. And that's the main, uh, that's the main reason uh, that we're trying to, to build this approach.